Susan Hart, and I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you today to our Government Affairs Forum. We're so pleased to have you all here today, and also to have Senator Merkley with us. Um, to start our program, I just wanted to thank our sponsors, Riverview Community Bank and Casey Ryan. He just ran out of the room, but thank you for your support. Uh, Gresham Barlow School District, uh, thank you, Jim Schlocker, Superintendent. Um, PGE is one of our sponsors, as well as Metro East Community Media, who does take this session, will rebroadcast it for us. So thank you to all of our sponsors for making this program possible. I'd also like to say thank you to Senator Lori Monas Anderson for being here, and uh, Gresham City Councilor Lori Stegman. So thank you for our elected officials. And there are a variety of chamber board members here, and I'd just like to have you raise your hand and thank you for your service to the chamber and leading us in our strategic direction. So we appreciate all of your efforts for the chamber. And with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Andre Wang, who is our government affairs chair and also a board member to start our session. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we are just, uh, we are pleased and honored to have Senator Merkley here with us. Um, the Senator will give us uh, some remarks, and then with the time uh, remaining, we'll uh, open the floor to questions from our chamber members. So uh, Senator Jeff Merkley is a native Oregonian, born in Myrtle Creek and grew up in Roseburg. And after high school, he actually has come full circle, began his uh, time of public service in the U United States Senate as an intern for Senator Hatfield. Since then, he went on to hold positions in the Congressional Budget Office and the Pentagon as a national security analyst. In 1991, Senator Merkley returned to Oregon uh, to be director of Portland's Habitat for Humanity, and then, of course, as executive director of the Oregon World Affairs Council. In 1998, Senator Merkley was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives, representing East Portland, and then in 2007 was elected Speaker of the House. He was elected to the United States Senate in November 2008, where he serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senate Banking and Housing Urban Affairs Committee, and the Senate Budget Committee. He is a graduate of David Douglas High School, holds his bachelor's from Stanford, and his master's in public policy from Princeton. Now, I uh, actually first met Senator Merkley 14 years ago we were at a reception for, I think it was the Chinese ambassador to the US, he was here, and they brought out the most interesting, funky, local food for the ambassador. And we were actually sitting at the same table, and as each dish was going by, uh, Jeff would turn to me and go, is this okay to eat? Is this okay to eat? <laughs> yes, is this okay to eat? So we please welcome back to, uh, to our community, Senator Jeff Merck. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to come. And it's uh, wonderful to be, see fellow Senator Lori Lona Sanderson. And uh, I really miss serving in the Oregon legislature. The, uh, uh, you, would, you would expect, really, that the US Senate would, would function in a very professional way. But as I think many of you know, it's broken. And so um, many days I'm reminiscing about the uh, smooth functioning, not that there aren't battles, there aren't there decisions that people like or dislike, but bills get considered, uh, they get voted on committee, they get freely debated on the floor with folks there listening to each other, and uh, it's just a wonderful institution, the Oregon Legislature. Thank you for dedicating so many years of your time Lori, uh, to representing this community and making Oregon a better state. Well done. A really big challenge for all of us is the existence of living wage jobs. And I know as members in the business community, you see this all the time. In the recession that we just went through, by various estimates, 60 to 80% of the jobs that we lost were living wage jobs. And in the recovery, only about 40% are living wage jobs. So that means a tremendous number of families, millions of families across the country, are really struggling to have the financial foundation to be successful. In fact, we should really judge the success of our economy, not by the Dow Jones and not by the gross domestic product, but how many families have a strong foundation to succeed? And in that sense, we are doubling down on a trend that hasn't gone so well for several decades. From 1945 through 1975, 
we had a huge expansion of, of the middle class, a huge expansion of living wage jobs. But from 1975 till now, living, uh, the working wages have been flat and then declining through the last decade. And then this recovery is not making things work any better. So that should have us do a lot of thinking about what are the pathways to building a successful middle class in America. And certainly one is living wage jobs. Another is home ownership. Yet another is education. And yet another is small business. These are really the four pillars of a middle class. And I thought I'd say a little bit about, about each one, one of them. Uh, first, and, and then we'll just open it up to your questions and comments on any topic uh, that, that, that you like. So starting with jobs, one of the things that we could and should be doing right now is investing more in infrastructure. It makes sense as a nation to invest when interest rates are low, as they have been, and for us to look around the world and see what's happening with our competitors. China is spending 10% of its gross domestic product on infrastructure. If you've had a chance to visit a few years apart, you'd see remarkable change. In the decade between my first visit and my second visit, Beijing went from bicycles to a bullet train. It was very spooky getting on a 200 mile per hour train in Beijing on my last trip there. Have, I don't know, some of, have, you, have some of you had a chance to see China and how fast it's changing? Well, Europe is spending 5% of its gross domestic product on infrastructure. And here in the United States, how much are we spending? 2%. Bare, barely enough to repair the aging infrastructure we have, uh, let alone build the infrastructure for the future. Let me turn to another area, which is essentially uh, home construction. Here in Oregon, we have a lot of stake in home ownership and in home construction because we produce grass seed, a nursery stock, uh, we produce insulated doors and, and windows. Of course, lumber is a huge product around the state. We produce uh, roofing products. So as home construction goes up, so does much of our local economy. So we need to be thinking about how to restore and get uh, home construction back on its feet. And related to that is an area of renovating the buildings we have for better energy conservation. Now the reason I raise this is this is one of those real win-wins. If you have low-cost loans for energy saving renovations, businesses and homeowners say, well, I can replace these aluminum windows with double-paned vinyl windows because the savings I'll have in energy will offset the cost of the replacement. And this is done particularly well through electrical co-ops where they can put it on their bill. I have, I have a bill called the, the Rural Electric Energy Savings Program, also known as Rural Star, and Building Star, which does it for commercial side. And uh, both of this, these bills have had bipartisan support. Rural Star has passed the, the House twice and gone to the, the or excuse me, passed the House. Still an old member of the Oregon House. Has passed the Senate twice, U.S. Senate twice, and gone to the House. And I found it particularly interesting one day when former President Bill Clinton came in to give a speech. And he, he spent 20 minutes talking about how the best bang for the buck in America in creating jobs is energy saving renovation. And of course, he went through the logic of it, which is you can't outsource the jobs. The jobs are middle income, so you get a lot of jobs for the amount spent. And the materials used are virtually all made here in America. And so I was trying to send him mind waves so that he would say, well, and two of the major bills on this topic are the bills from the senator from Oregon. But I didn't succeed. Uh, he didn't, he didn't uh, make, that, make that comment. I talked to his staff afterwards. He gives his speech again. Could he note those, those two bills? But um, uh, certainly another area where we have to fight for jobs is in manufacturing. Now, I've been on this Made in Oregon manufacturing tour. And I've been talking to folks about what's working and what isn't. One big issue that our manufacturing sector is raising is we don't have enough folks who are ready right now to be able to use tools, show up on time, and pass a drug test. And I don't know if any of you have, I've seen some shaking heads, yes, here. I talked to a business the other day. I went and toured their factory floor, and the, uh, the uh, executive said, you know, I got a call last week 
from my national operation, and they want us to add an expansion here of 200 jobs. This is on the, on the west side. And I told them, I didn't think we could do it here in Oregon, because we don't have enough supply of folks with those skills. And what they're looking for is for us to do a lot more in high school and middle school to have folks get used to using tools and seeing that there are career pathways. So I've introduced a, a bill called the BUILD Act, Career Technical Education. Really, it's, it's to say a little bit of what we did in No Child Left Behind was a mistake. When we focused on No Child Left Behind just on the math and reading side, we eliminated our shop classes. Now, I, I grew up, my dad was a mechanic. He was a, he was a millwright, uh, which is the mechanic who keeps a, a lumber mill going. And then he worked on heavy equipment. We grew up with tools, grew up building things from mini bikes to uh, go-karts. And I loved working with tools, but I also really enjoyed shop class. I had a chance in electronics, and in wood shop, and in metal shop, and I still love tools. And so I wanted to introduce my kids to that. And so when my son was three years old, and we started building a tree house, he was out there with a screw gun. Well, he was pretty enamored of it until he became part of our, our modern culture where kids don't get introduced to, to tools in school. They do get introduced to is electronics, uh, computer screens, if you will. And like most of our youth, it didn't kind of take root that you can make cool things with, with your hands and you can be part of an industry. So that effort uh, is important uh, for us to pursue, to be able to expand manufacturing here in Oregon and create jobs. And with that goes something called STEM. And I've been the Senate champion on STEM, science, technology, education, mathematics which may lead to careers, but, or it may lead to college, but it reinforces a whole mathematics science side uh, of our preparation. Well, uh, moving on from jobs to uh, home ownership, I just want to mention how important it is in the, tr the middle class to have home ownership be a system of creating wealth. And we went off track between 2003 and 2008. We had the introduction of uh, these new teaser rate loans. And after two years, they went to a much higher interest rate. And we had normal underwriting was kind of set aside and we had what were technically called un undocumented loans. And it did feed a big bubble, but it's a big bubble that was going to burst because it didn't have a solid foundation. And so I have been immersed and uh, got past provisions that would restore the, the mortgage as a reliable product of, of wealth creation banning of prepayment penalties and the steering payments uh, that helped the whole operation go uh, awry. And so we have, to su we have to sustain that. There are a lot of folks who said during 2008, 2009, we just shouldn't be a home ownership society. I disagree completely. I saw when I was head of Habitat how powerful home ownership was in affecting the heart, your sense of place in the community, that you had a stake you did a lot more about picking up litter. You cared a lot more about the quality of the local school when you owned a home. And you had capital that you could use to launch a small business, you could use to help send your kids to college, a whole host of things that were extremely empowering. So let us not become a nation that gives up on, on home ownership. And by the way, we have to absolutely make sure we don't smother home ownership with a mortgage industry that requires 20% down payments. If you go back and look at the defaults, the amount of the down payment is a very small factor. 3% uh, down payments were very successful as long as the loans were written, underwritten well and, uh, and affordable to, the, to the, the family. So let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, let me turn to education, another key pathway of the middle class. I felt, I don't know that I understood at the time, but. Uh, when I was small, my parents said to me, we hope you'll go to college, and we will help make that possible. And so I always just assumed it was possible. I'm not sure my parents knew how they'd make it possible, but they were saving money, and they were telling me it can be done. And so I accepted that. And I accepted the vision my father laid out for me, which was he said, if you go through the doors of that schoolhouse and you work hard, here in America you can do just about anything. And so they nurtured kind of aspiration to pursue dreams. And who knew what those dreams might, might be as they, they would unfold. But right now, we are having a turn in our society. 
where the cost of college is starting to be a millstone around the neck of our students. And fear of that millstone is changing the attitude of parents and students. And it also means that students are often going to semester and they're dropping out. And then they're trying to make enough money to go back, but you can't save much money on a minimum wage job without a, without a degree. And so college becomes a, a path delayed or possibly abandoned. I want every child to have the same message from the parents, that there is a path for you to be able to fulfill your aspirations, which means our children will be much more likely to succeed, and our whole society will be much better off from their success. So it's a win-win. It's a so we have to find a way to control the cost of higher education. How many folks are a little worried about the cost of higher education? Okay, well, that's about all of us. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have uh, students who have just gone through and are, are challenged by the debt. Uh, I see some shaking heads there. Uh, I have two teenagers. I have a junior and senior. They're, they're becoming a junior and senior, so they'll be off to, to college uh, soon, hopefully. But, uh, so one thing is, tuition has been going up about 6% above the general cost uh, of inflation. And yet it should be cheaper, if anything, now, because we have technologies that allow us to replicate guidance on how to do things in an electronic way that we never, never had before. You can capture the best lectures in America. You can capture the best courses. You can help provide them. So we have to find a way to, to do that. Georgia has a, a school that's experimenting. They are not only putting some courses online, but they are allowing credit for the, for the first time at a much reduced tuition rate. It's the first college, major college to experiment in that, in that fashion to actually allow credit. I don't know if that's a good model, but it's, it's important to, uh, to experiment. I also am, am deeply supportive of a plan that has been initiated by our state legislature. And I'm sure uh, Lori was there engaged in the debates. Uh, but the idea was, and it's called Pay It Forward, that as an alternative to loan, you basically <coughs> pledge a percent of your future income in order to get your current education paid for. Now this is very appealing as a potential strategy. And I know that I was the first in my family to go to college. And getting through it without massive debt gave me a lot more opportunities. But I can envision a situation where somebody might say, I'm not sure if I sign up for this loan and this loan and this loan, the percent of payments come out of my salary may be so great that basically I'm crushed by it. But if alternatively, I'm only pledging a percent of my future income, I know that I can, let's say it's 3%, I know that I can live on $3 less out of 100. I know that, and so I know there's a path, so I will pursue that path. Now there's a lot of questions about the details of the pay it forward vision. And so the legislature has said, and unanimously, bipartisan, by Camerill, the Oregon legislature said, Department of Education, bring us a fully detailed plan by 2015 for the next six month session. But one of the key issues that was raised was, a big hurdle is how do you get the corpus of funds up front in order to start the ball rolling? And in this case, I think there's a potential federal partnership because if students instead of taking out a Stafford loan, are going to get a pay it forward grant, then let's take what they would have gotten a Stafford loan and help capitalize the corpus to get the project started and be in partnership with the states. So I'm proposing a pilot project. I'll be introducing legislation in September that basically would say, let's partner with four or five states that attempt to put this idea into motion and let's learn from their experience. So I'll be uh, continuing to, to work on that. And one of the, one of, someone said to me the other day, said, but you know, if you happen to get lucky and you make a ton of money, you're going to be paying a tremendous amount more than if you're taking out loans. Yes, that's right. Because there's the beauty of it. You get the blessing, if you are enormously successful, you get the blessing of helping a whole lot of kids go to college in the next generation. But if you, you earn a modest amount, then you know you have a manageable burden to bear. And therefore, you see that there is a pathway to pursue your, your education. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
uh, financing and small business. I, I just came from an event that, that Google was putting on today downtown, and they essentially have a, a plan where they give you a free website and website servicing for a year, and they're doing these seminars all around the country helping small businesses that aren't yet on the web get onto the, the web. Seminars are, are free, they're holding one today. Uh, some of your members may, may be down there right now. The room was, was, was packed. And what was very striking to me was the statistics that of folks who use the web, 97% use it to find their products they want to buy. And they want to buy them locally because it's, it's more convenient and they want to support their local community. But of the small businesses that are offering products, 57% are not on the web which means half the, oh, more than half the businesses that you might buy from locally aren't, aren't there and you don't know they're, they're there. And several of the, the entrepreneurs I talked to this morning were very excited because they said, oh, I've had this project. I've been planning to get onto the web for a year. My husband keeps telling me it's such a crucial component. I'm, I'm the, the accountant for our business, but I'm also the, I'm going to be the web person. And then finally the seminar made it possible. So anyway, that... Um, the web is a, certainly a huge communication device. But another big challenge for business is uh, access to credit. And I, I've done several things related to that because I heard from it in my town halls as I went around Oregon. I go to every county every year. So I think I just did my 174th town hall uh, yesterday. So one has been to fight to extend the 90% guarantee on small business loans so that community banks are more comfortable making loans while employment, unemployment is still high and things are spotty. A, a second was to create the Small Business Lending Fund that recapitalized community banks that had reached their leverage limit so they could be able to make more loans. But a third uh, is something that, to design something that never existed before, which is a framework, and it's called crowdfunding, for essentially investing through the internet in small businesses. Now some of you may have tried some of the peer-to-peer -peer lending sites where you can put up a vision for your business and say I need to get a loan of, of $20,000 to get new uh, ovens for my pizza parlor. And if enough people sign up and say yes I'll make the loan on the terms that you've laid out, then the website as a banking intermediary makes the, the loan and pulls the money from all those individuals and then pays them the interest back. Well, that's peer-to-peer -peer lending. But crowdfunding is basically a strategy for to have investors in a, in a business. And to be able to do that over the web and bypass venture capital world with all the restrictions that that involves. And so I won't take a lot of time to explain all the details, but the rules are being written right now. The legislation, my legislation did pass both chambers. It was signed by the president. And uh, the rules are being written right now. So sometime next year or towards the end of this year, we expect it to become a possibility. And the, what we anticipate is that there will be all kinds of creative experiments in how to make this work. That some chambers will sponsor websites. Some cities will sponsor websites. Some will specialize in certain types of businesses. Some will specialize in vetting the proposals to make sure that they're absolutely accurate, authentic, and legitimate, and thereby make them a safe place for folks to come and, and invest. We put a lot of restrictions on the initial phase of this in terms of the amount one can invest, the percentage of income you, you can invest, and the size of the investment that you can obtain. So it would be targeted for small businesses, and so we wouldn't have people who are wiped out by some type of, of fraud. So the goal is to make it a successful effort without, if you will, pump and dump fraud type activities that could poison uh, the well. So to stay tuned on, on that. Now for all, these concepts, uh, be it successful home ownership, uh, small business financing, education, uh, creation of living wage jobs, for these to be successful, the legislative process has to be successful. And so there's two things I wanted to mention in this regard. The first is we have to stop lurching from crisis to crisis. A lot of the big business world has been very successful the last few years, and that's why the stock market is so high. But they're sitting on a lot of cash that could be invested. And one of the things they keep saying is, as long as we're lurching from crisis to crisis, we're not really comfortable making a big bet on the future of the American economy. 
So let's quit lurching from crisis to crisis. And here's what's going on. You have a process in US Congress that involves both sides developing a budget, reconciling those budgets, getting a common budget, using that budget then to, to as a framework for the 12 appropriation bills. Each side passes those 12 bills, they meet in conference, and by the end of September they're passed and you go forward for the next year. Well, that process is deeply broken. You know, there's this uh, poll that said that 92% of Americans think Congress is broken. And I thought, you know, what's, what's wrong with the other 8%? <laughs> Have they not noticed? Uh, it is, uh, to give you an example right now, the Senate passed a budget this year, the House passed a budget, would like to have a conference committee, but the conference committee is being filibustered on the Senate side. That's crazy, because without a common budget number, now the Senate is doing their appropriation bills to one number, the House is doing their appropriation bills to another number, and then folks say, well, one reason to vote against the appropriation bills is because we don't have the same number as the House. Well, then what happens? Then what happens is you come to the end of September and you have no authorization for the next fiscal year, so you have a crisis. That's what we've been doing, lurching from crisis to crisis, sometimes with three-month extensions, of, and instead of appropriation bills, you have what's called continuing resolutions. Well, that's a pretty little, literal, literal description of what happens since you don't have the new bills that would incorporate what, doing more of what works and getting rid of what doesn't, you go with the old structure and you continue it into the future, which is a very wasteful way to approach things because all the time you spent finding out what works and doesn't work is not incorporating a new spending plan. And it means that a few members of leadership, bipartisan leadership of the, of the House and Senate get together, a few key committee chairs, and they write their own bill, which may have nothing to do with all the conversations taking place. Bill, big thick bill that incorporates, uh, sometimes it's called an omnibus, which means all of the appropriation bills, sometimes it's called a microbus, some of them the spending bills, but essentially it comes out and you're, you're supposed to vote on it a couple hours later with really no committee process, no hearings, no deliberation, no ability to digest. If you read spending bills, you can't tell what they mean. I mean, you need a transparent process, committee process, to be able to translate what it means when it says change law such and such to read so and so, and change number such and such to mean such and such. Well. So this affects the success of our economy. So we have to quit behaving like this. And that leads me to my next point, which is on the Senate that means we have to rein in the abuse of the filibuster. This is an area that I jumped into after being elected because I was appalled to see the disintegration of the Senate from the Senate I knew in the 1970s and the 1980s. It is deeply disturbing. I'm going to try to capture because it's kind of, it can be a confusing topic, so I want to try to simplify it in a way that makes sense. Here's the way it worked in the past. If you didn't like a bill and you wanted to keep the debate going, you could object to closing debate, but instead there was a social contract that you wouldn't object, you would instead take the floor and talk. You had the right to object, but it wasn't exercised because there was an expectation that if you really thought there should be more debate, you would debate. And there are three senators in history that have done 24-hour delays in that process. There are folks who have done chain delays, one after the other. Uh, Wayne Morris from Oregon was one of, the, one of the folks who is in the top three for that filibuster crew. Well, this continued until about 15 years ago. And at that point, kind of the, the bitter partisanship that has been gripping our nation led to folks start saying, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to argue we shouldn't close debate, but I'm not willing to spend time and energy and actually speak. I'm just going to object. When there's unanimous consent requested, I'm just going to object. Well, uh, the result has been the emergence of the silent filibuster, where you have to get 60 votes to close debate, the, actually, if you tune into C-SPAN, all you see is a roll call because nobody really has anything left to say, and then eventually you go on to the next bill. 
And let's see kind of the damage that has been done by this. Well, one is we don't have a budget conference committee between the House and the Senate right now to get a common number. Another is a bill that was to replace the sequester with a series of savings that are coming from areas the Senate had already approved, couldn't get onto the floor to begin with because the motion to proceed to the bill was filibuster. And the list goes on and on and on. In 2011 and 2012, so that's 12 appropriation bills each year, 24 appropriation bills, one was passed by the Senate. That's the kind of dysfunction we're in the middle of, and it's serving no one well. So here's what I'm proposing. Get rid of the filibuster on the motion to proceed to the floor. Get rid of it on conference committees. And if you're going to have a filibuster in which people object rather than speaking, then do it this way. 41 have to say they want to continue to debate, and then at least one of them has to be debating. So by rule, we reestablish the talking filibuster and get rid of the silent filibuster. And by doing so, we make this transparent so you can tune in and see what's going on. America can see it, and you can hold the Senate. The citizens of America can hold the Senate accountable. They can say, that filibuster, that person organizing that, they are a hero. They're doing a wonderful thing blocking that terrible legislation. Or they are a bum. And you contact your local senator and say, support it or oppose it. Whereas now, citizens absolutely just, it's invisible. You don't see it. So it's transparency and it's accountability. If we want job creation legislation to get through the Senate, we must reform the filibuster. If we want to make sure that home ownership is a path of wealth building for the middle class, we need to get rid of the filibuster. If we want to make sure that there is financing, whatever reforms are necessary for small business, we need to get rid of the filibuster. If we want to stop the lurching from crisis to crisis, so that big business that has been able to make a lot of money will invest it back and help create the chain of events that leads to success for many small businesses because of the supply chain, then we need to reform the filibuster. And if we want our kids to not be cynical about a government, but believe in a nation, as Lee can frame it, of, by, and for the people, and believe that that's possible in our modern society today, the Senate needs to reform the filibuster. Thanks so much for inviting me. All right, we'll open the floor for your questions. And, um, and so since we don't have the roving mic, we'll just recognize you, state your question. I'll repeat the question for our television audience so they uh, can hear and then have the, um, uh, have the uh, senator respond. So our first question uh, from Scott, uh, Dr. Hansen. And then uh, uh, please identify your name and business. All right, so the, the question is on the Affordable Care Act and uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates to the states. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. And there's a whole series of, of questions that cover Oregon, uh, which is the name given to the exchange and the effort to implement the Affordable Care Act in Oregon. They are holding seminars right now on a whole host of pieces of the uh, puzzle. Uh, the, um, uh, that's not the, the question I thought you were going to ask because uh, most small businesses are asking me, uh, what does this mean for me in the next six months? Uh, what happens October 1st? And there, the six month window to sign up begins. And so let me start there before I get to the, the I think you said Medicaid, if I, I couldn't hear it too clearly, but Medicaid portion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, let me start with, with uh, the, the, that piece and then go to the, uh, the, the Medicaid piece. Uh, the, the main thing that should relieve some anxiety is that small businesses, uh, those have less than 50 FTE, uh, basically can sit back and relax. And here's why. Uh, if you are providing insurance, uh, you can choose to keep providing insurance or you can choose to go to the exchange and buy a policy. If you're not providing insurance, you're not required to provide insurance. And so um, um, it's like, oh, okay. If I sit and do nothing or keep doing what I've been doing, I can learn from what happens with others and decide down the road what I, what I want to do as a small business. This issue on Medicaid is something that goes to the heart of a process that we struggle with at the state level. When I was in the state legislature, 
because there are different pieces of the Medicaid puzzle that are compensated at different reimbursement ratios. And we went through, and, and uh, Senator Monas Anderson was there, the process of having to turn back Medicaid, which is the Oregon Health Plan in our state. And we lost about 100,000 families off it when the state couldn't afford, because of the recession here, to make the match. So I'm, I'm largely, you're the first person to have asked that specific question. So I'm going to go back and check with my team to see if there are other insights on it and I'll get back in contact with you. And, and Jake, back here, if you can wave your hand around. Uh, we'll make sure it gets your name so we can follow up. Uh, but my belief is the states are gonna keep doing what we have done over time, which is each year struggling with the reimbursement rates, struggling with our own funds that we as a state can afford to put in knowing that the degree that we can, can provide more funds into the process, we will create more match and bring more dollars into Oregon and be able to serve a larger Medicaid population. But um, this will be a significant piece to adjust to at the, the moment you're referring to. And I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how that will reverberate. So let me learn a little bit more about it. So the question is, uh, who and how will crowdfunding uh, lenders be regulated? It'll be, it'll be regulated by the SEC. And they are developing the rules. They're overdue now. Uh, and they're taking a lot of time to, to really try to get this right. Now, the statute itself was written to start small to try to make sure that there were a lot of safeguards. For example, one thing that I had a, a big battle with on the House side was whether or not the principals are held personally accountable for the accuracy of the information. If you don't do that, you end up with just a mess. And so I was able to prevail in that, in that effort to make sure it had that type of integrity and accountability. But the SEC is working to translate that into the rules that will allow uh, this uh, to uh, unfold. We also put in kind of a fast cycle review so that they would essentially watch this whole new world with special attention. So if things develop from their rules that weren't anticipated, they could respond hopefully quickly and adjust, and adjust them. Right, so action steps on uh, pay equity. So uh, uh, the, one of the first bills I voted on in the US Senate was the Lilly Ledbetter. And there's an additional follow-up to that that I've supported that has not yet passed the, the Senate. Uh, and I was very supportive in the Oregon legislature for us to uh, support paid sick days, and I supported it at the, at the national level as well. And I realize, it's, I realize there's controversy over it. Uh, but I think in the end, uh, we do uh, far better if we don't have folks who are uh, sick uh, getting everyone else sick in terms of the uh, productivity of our of our society. So, I think it I think it makes sense. A question uh, on job creation and all that goes with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought maybe you're going to look at the post notes and read a few uh, clauses <laughs> for us. Well, I just think you you gave an excellent speech. On, on the challenges we're, we're facing. When, when you got to the last sentence, you said, what are we gonna do about that? I'm not sure which well, piece of it that that I should apply to. Piece of that small businesses are the economic generators yes. in our economy. But all the legislation that comes through is onerous on small business. Healthcare is onerous on small business. I don't care how you slice it, dice it, nobody's telling us how it's gonna work. Lending is onerous on small business because some of us are redlined. Some of us are in industries that if our franchise holders were the longest money, we wouldn't be able to get money anywhere else. Yes, yes. And then we talk about job days. I personally think I can run my business. You know, I mean, my employees are really happy. <laughs> and they get days off when they need days off and so forth. So I think, Brett, lift this up not tell us what to do. You know what I mean? Like, how mm -hmm. do you lift this up? Yes. Okay. Well, um, so, well said. I don't think I can, first, you're absolutely right about small business being the job generators, uh, and that's why so much of my time has been about access to capital. Uh, in, when it gets into the regulatory impingements, 
this is where it's very helpful for, um, for my team and, and Jake's my liaison to try to collect the, the targets of the things that really aren't working because we've got to fix those things that really aren't working. And you're on the front line and you may be able to say no. Uh, in addition to my general concerns, here are three things that absolutely would work a lot better if we change them. And then that gives me the, the ability to focus on those three, understand it, talk to the, the various uh, uh, employment groups uh, that um, uh, ad advocate for small business and say, is this something we can champion? Can I get some partners across the aisle? And, or is this a regulatory issue that we can weigh in and get the regulation changed and pursue it in that type of uh, uh, format? And that feedback loop comes from you all because you all know what's going right and wrong. And sometimes, let's take, for example, healthcare. Healthcare is a sixth of our economy. There's going to be a fair amount of things that will go right with the Affordable Care Act, and there'll be a bunch of things that go wrong. And we're going to have to modify those things that go wrong. You can't be involved in that big a piece of the American pie and not have pieces that don't work. Uh, one part of the act really was about trying to create a place where consumers of healthcare can become shoppers and thereby compare apples to apples in policies and hopefully, the hope is that it will drive competition and that the prices offered will be lower and that by being part of a larger pool you'll get a better price than if you were trying to get insurance by your own as a small business. Now that's a theory. Is it going to work? We're going to find out. And as we find out, the things that don't work, we're going to have to fix. So, um, work with <laughs> I, do we have any, um, anyone in the room who's a navigator for uh, Cover Oregon? The, the navigators are spreading out to, to basically provide that type of intense briefing. I read one yesterday uh, and we can put you in touch even though, and I don't, Lori, feel free if you want to, uh, because this is being done at the state level, feel free if you want to chip in, but the, the states, Oregon has worked harder to prepare for this moment than just about any other state in the country and is hiring a large group to educate. They will come here, they will offer seminars, they have webinars, they're doing everything possible to try to get the questions answered. And the sign up period is a six month period starting October 1st. So we, we don't all have to have every answer on October 1st uh, because it's not a, a deadline. Uh, but do you want to add anything? Talk a little bit about how those things can be so the question is on the uh, federal mandate's uh, impact on local school districts. I think what you've described is, is very much the same as I spent a year uh, preparing for the debate in the, uh, the uh, Senate Education Committee over replacing No Child Left Behind. So I was meeting with the superintendents, school boards, parents all over the state, and it was amazing how consistent the message was in rural and urban areas about what was working and what wasn't working. It also turned out to be amazing how much different senators from different parts of the country brought the same message. So uh, last year we had a bipartisan bill come out of the, the Senate Education Committee and unfortunately it didn't get through the floor because of the paralysis I've previously described. So now there is a new uh, ranking member of the Senate Education Committee and the process is starting all over again. And um, often when you have the, the previous model, they tweak it a little and send it back out and speed it up. In this case, uh, the new ranking member has thoughts that are going to require a lot more work and it's not clear the committee is going to be able to produce a bill. Mean, so meanwhile, it puts us in the, uh, the world uh, of the, uh, the waiver process where Oregon's obtained a waiver, but there were strings attached to that waiver. And so there's still a whole set of things to, to wrestle with. And one of the things, just to, uh, uh, to give you a couple examples of the sorts of messages I heard around the state, one was no child left behind actually causes two-thirds of the children to be left behind in the following manner, that a teacher has to focus so much on the kids who are near the bubble of passing the bar that they can't do as much for the, for the kids who have already have those abilities and they can't do as much for the kids who are a long ways away and aren't going to make it past that bar. And that that's a corrupting, inappropriate influence within the classroom, please change that. So that's just one example. Another was all of these uh, uh, grants that you have to compete for may make sense if you're a huge district with a grant writer. 
Uh, but if you're a tiny district, uh, you don't have the ability to prepare to compete for these grants, so we need to have more uh, formula-driven grants, understanding that otherwise you don't get a fair distribution of resources. Those are a couple examples of the messages I brought. Uh, so I'm hoping the spirit that permeated that committee last year will be renewed. I'm no longer on the committee. Uh, I moved from health education and labor to appropriations. That is a huge bet on the future success of the Senate in restoring its process. I am serving on the subcommittee that is involved in education funding. So I can still be involved in CTE and STEM and so forth, both as an advocate and advocating for funding. Uh, so uh, stay tuned in the, in the dialogue and I'll, I'll keep working on it. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a green light for one more question. Mark. Uh, we have Workforce, Workforce Investment Act. Listen, everything in, the, in you look at the legislative process in D.C., uh, it's hard to have high hopes for any one bill because let's, let's look at the Farm Bill, always passed before the August in-state period until last year. And then it wasn't passed. And in fact, it didn't even come up in the House. This year, the Senate passed it. It came up in the House, and there was a huge blow-up uh, over it. And now it doesn't look like the House is going to appoint conferees. Senate, Senate filibuster is blocking conferees on the budget. It looks like the House is going to block conferees on the Farm Bill. It's a mess. So I don't want to cast false hopes that there is a special path for WEA that will avoid that entanglement. But there are people on both sides of Capitol Hill who, and both sides of the aisle, who understand how important this is as a pathway to successful middle class jobs and a successful economy. And so I hope we can bring those folks together and, and make it happen. But I won't argue that the path is absolutely clear to, to make it happen. So I want to thank you all very much for inviting me to come. You know, I still live in the David Douglas School, School District next door, just to just across the boundary between Portland and Gresham. It's great to be here in Fairview. Mary and I came out when this community, the Fairview Village, was, was being constructed because we'd read so many interesting things about the strategies of creating a, a livable a, a community with different types of housing and uh, retail nearby. And uh, so it's, it's good to come out and, and see it here many years later. And please do uh, stay connected with me and my team on business issues, you can always uh, reach the right member of my team through Jake. Jake may be the right member as a business liaison, but he may also be able to connect you to our person who's working on tax policy or, or community college uh, training for career training and community college is so essential. In Oregon. And by the way, great job uh, helping leading the coalition to prepare that grant. And I, I have, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So thank you all so much. It's an honor to serve as your U.S. Senator. Thank you again, Senator Merkley, and thanks again uh, to his staff and to Allison for making this happen. Um, just please uh, take a few seconds to fill out the evaluations that are on your tables. And also, you are welcome to grab a, a mug on your way out from Riverview Community Bank, courtesy and compliments of them. Uh, just a reminder that our next program will be September 24. Uh, we'll uh, pre be presenting a discussion on the upcoming uh, Gresham Barlow School District bond measure. That will be September 24, Tuesday, 11.30 at Persimmon. And then on October 22, Tuesday, uh, we, our featured speaker will be Oregon's Chief Operating Officer, Michael Jordan. And, um, and just a reminder, after this meeting, our Government Affairs Council will be meeting for a special meeting downstairs in the conference room for about half an hour or so. Uh, so just after this meeting, uh, members of the Government Affairs Council will meet downstairs. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you next month.